Okay, let's continue the lecture where we left off. And we'll we're, uh, begin with this section on monasticism. Singha is a term that also refers to any monastic community. Buddhist monasteries dedicated to teaching and promoting acts of kindness flourish worldwide. Buddha taught that monks should pursue a middle way between two extremes of austerity and hedonistic comfort. Uh, there is no benefit in luxurious pleasures because they provide false comforts, will hinder spiritual concentration, and will harm the moral life. In many countries, nuns and monks are recognizable by their austere lifestyle, shaved heads and flowing gowns or robes. They are also usually celibates, meaning unmarried. Uh, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, they're celibates. Although celibacy is not expected for lay people. Lay people refers to those who are not religious leaders or not monks or nuns, but the normal people. Um, early Buddhist nuns and monks in India found their yellow robes and garbage dumps. This was a statement of priorities and not an expression of asceticism or austerity. Their hope had given them a new way to overcome sensual and mortal preoccupations by purifying their minds. A monk or nun has renounced all common duties. Uh, wealth and family matters are of no concern to monastics, to monks and nuns. This is not a negation of something good, but an affirmation of something much better. Nuns and monks follow a strict communal discipline and place themselves under the oversight of a teacher. Admission to the first orders is open to all men for 20 years. They take on new robes and are given new names. All Buddhist monks and nuns observe at least 227 different precepts in daily life or that many different rules. Some groups have even more rules. Many new Orthodox monks, for example, follow such strict guidelines as not being allowed to handle money, to eat anything after noon, to attend stage performances, or even to live in the same building as a member of the opposite sex. Monks and nuns depend on alms offered by lay people, which the laity believe provides merit for the next life. Orthodox Buddhist monks spend much of their lives in the study of scripture and in meditation. Let's turn to ethics. Right morality is vital for the coherence of any community. Buddhists are commanded not to destroy life, steal, lie, drink alcohol, or engage in sexual immorality. Two prized ethical values of Buddhism are wisdom and compassion. Apart from Christianity, there is no tradition which places such an emphasis on loving others. Love is a prelude to and a consequence of wisdom. To empathize with the sufferings of others is to begin the path to enlightenment. Buddhism teaches not to love enemies, but simply not to hate them, because hatred is a hindrance to inner peace. Love is part of self-perception and is the emphasis on compassion uh, that gives the Dharma its appeal to the unenlightened. Love is the guiding motive of right conduct, the fourth step in the Eightfold Path. Ethical excellence is an indispensable quality of an enlightened life. The lofty ethics of the Sangha compare well to the violent histories of other religions. The aim of right conduct is not personal transformation, but abolishing all traces of individuality. Especially in acts of charity, we should stay on the middle path and not seek merit for ourselves. Let's talk about shared healing. The first Sangha and the first church 
in our lives is found within a family that shares faith and devotion. Both Jesus and Siddhartha had lives full of family affairs. There are many family issues addressed in both religions because families are at the heart of fostering healthy civic society. For a Buddhist, family ties aid steps toward liberation because in a family there is no room for pretense and no place to hide. Families are an ideal context to nurture virtue and learning. Families eliminate loneliness and promote open-mindedness and sharing um, by necessity with numerous domestic challenges. Monastic traditions are a significant way the Sangha and the church have advanced the faith. Monasteries become embedded in local cultures and unite communities while expressing both cultural and religious values. At the same time, neither community teaches that those who are not in monasteries are second-class believers or less part of the Sangha and the church. Or, or the church. Uh, a monk or nun is not automatically a better Buddhist than a lay person, and both need each other for mutual growth. Jesus stated that he was present with communities of two or three that gather in his name. He is also present in acts of charity to the poor, who he calls us to see as brothers and sisters. Christians are bound with Jesus and with each other. Across all differences and in every age, Jesus is the, Jesus is the center of all Christian communities. In the same way, Buddhist teaching is central to any Sangha. Church and Sangha are vitalized by a shared commitment to honor one another in love. Both Jesus and Buddha called us to build communities around others and not around self-interested ego demands. Let's turn to ritual power. The Sangha and the church are contexts where ritual is integrated into daily life. Both faiths warn against separating faith from practice. Faith is expressed through rituals, which also serve to educate the next generation with tangible expressions of beloved teachings. Critics dismiss faith-based rituals as showy expressions of glorified child play or sort of imaginative exercises. Uh, rituals are dismissed as acts of magical thinking that serve no useful function. Skeptics see rituals as contrived and superstitious activities. For the faithful, rituals are miraculous. They revision the mundane and affirm faith. The expression of various rituals point us to what is meaningful midstream in the pressing preoccupations of life. Ritual provides intriguing paths for interfaith dialogue. Some, however, wonder if it is possible for prayer to be shared between people of different religions, perhaps viewing it as spiritual infidelity, meaning betraying one's faith by engaging in uh, prayer or worship of a different deity. So others see it, see this interfaith prayer uh, as a loving risk where we meet others in devotion and not in argumentation. Let's turn to teaching communities. Faith communities often appoint and recognize elders as authoritative voices for, for mentorship. The teacher lives for others and surrenders personal life for the greater corporate good. Teaching is relational. A teacher only becomes a teacher with permission of a student. In many cultures, a student chooses a teacher and thus has the most leverage in the exchange learning or the learning exchange. Uh, one should carefully choose a teacher because who you become is largely based on whom you invite to be your teachers. Teaching can be a practice 
where spiritual and social transformations can be released, even without words. The Buddhist notion of thought transference asserts that simply being in the presence of someone will cause us to be affected either positively or negatively by those with whom we spend time. Thought transferences are when students immerse their minds in anti-rational constructs, which are intended to tear down misconceptions. Once incorrect notions are knocked away, often dramatically, the mind becomes an empty vacuum, able to become filled with the pure air of enlightenment. Whenever we think what we are doing is trying to order our delusions, uh, or whatever we think, what we are doing is trying to order our delusions, which give ourselves a sense of false security by imposing on our cluttered minds a set pattern of words. According to some Buddhists, the impartation of insight does not come through Buddha or through the community, but through our inward and outward teacher, the Buddha nature. Truths are passed through teachers and across generations and cultures. Teachers are soul doctors who provide healing cures for souls and work to keep away mind sickness from our lives. Teaching is an exercise of skillful means or appropriate method and something that brings transformation. Teaching is strong medicine for those ensnared in mundane, <clears throat> in mundane assumptions and misguided expectations. Truths taught uh, destroy unhealthy thought patterns or actions that accommodate a life of selfishness and lazy comfort. The truth taught confronts obsessive and false hopes. A teacher is a dangerous friend who challenges us to move beyond mindless obedience toward the infinite possibilities of enlightenment. Let's turn to sexual ethics. Faith communities remind us how forces of human sexuality relate to the formation of cohesive social ethics. Sadly, countless examples of paternal sexism have overridden mutual, mutual respect across the history of both Sangha and church when it comes to the promotion of healthy, committed, and empowering equality-based sexual values. Christianity historically defines sexual ethics in terms of the bonds of marriage, which foster loyal, faithful commitments instead of immediate pleasure and gratification. The shared sins of lust and adultery <laughs> or having sex outside of marriage, um, especially uh, having an adulterous affair with someone who's married to someone else, have long been attacked because they erode social co cohesion and counter integrity, trust, and relational stewardship. Similarly, pedophilia, rape, and other abusive, non-consensual sexual practices have been confronted by many people of goodwill. Buddhism teaches that the foundational principle of any sexual ethic must be to do no harm, defined as that which oppresses and uh, fosters relational disrespect. When we, be, when we betray the trust of others, we betray our own values and hopes for relational integrity. Discussions about homosexuality should take into account the larger context of Dharma insight because Buddha has no, has no implicit focus on same-sex relationships and is neutral on how homosexuality and heterosexuality might be interrelated. Historically, same-sex relationships 
have been common and accepted in many Asian cultures. At the same time, the European and North American prevalence for identifying human nature in terms of sexual preference is a newer development. So just defining yourself based on if you're um, heterosexual or homosexual, as if that's the most important characteristic about you, is sort of a thing. It didn't always exist like that. And or people didn't always do that in the past. So for Buddhists, same-sex relationships are neither good nor bad generally. What is of consequence is how any experience of sexual activity is either beneficial or abusive. A larger focus of most widely taught Buddhist social thought is that tolerance and flexibility are essential to addressing changing sexual values. For the Sangha, there is an unequivocal rejection of any expression of homophobia. Both religions teach that any assertion rooted in an arrogant dismissal of the other can never be healthy or healing. Celibacy is another issue of sexual ethics where both faiths share a legacy of promoting it as a path to insight. St. Paul and Jesus both taught that there is a place for celibacy, allowing a single person to have greater freedom to serve God. Celibacy can help one keep a focus on the eternal and keep one from temporal attachment. Leaders of the Sangha have forbidden all sexual practices among monks. Both traditions see celibacy as a way to find more time for spiritual devotion and a resource to promote deep friendships among members of our faith communities. Let's look at embodying faith. Faith communities share values through acts of service to those outside their walls. Temples and churches have served as places of hospitality, as healing centers, and even at times as feeding stations. The Sangha and church also exist as a witness to neighbors about the centrality of eternal values. Is the authority of the Sangha equal to that of the Christian church, seen by Christians as the body of Christ on earth? In Buddhism, the Sangha is also essential to the experience of faith. Dharma is understood through community. For Christians, the church is not only a place of nurture, but it embodies the presence of Jesus on earth. One cannot be a Christian apart from the church. In a similar way, one cannot be a Buddhist apart from participation in community. One should not separate Buddhist teachings from communities any more than one should separate Christian teachings from churches. Buddha's first preaching happened with the creation of a community while the visitation of the Holy Spirit marks the birthday of the church. A church is a gathering of pilgrim people passing through life. In the same way, the Sangha is an outpost of truth in a world of delusion. Christian and Buddhist communities are not only united in shared beliefs, but also function through shared commitments and covenants. Let's turn to reorientation. While both Christians and Buddhists undertake personal faith journeys, both traditions teach that they are tied into a transgenerational and international community. Communities serve as centers where we share a collective awareness of all we aspire to and cherish. Interdependence or dependent co-arising is at the core of Buddhist Dharma. We can be compassionate with all because we exist in webs of interrelationships with one another. In addition to enhancing spiritual lives, Faith communities exist to serve as centers of welcoming hospitality and to provide relief, social provision, relational healing, and shared learning. 
after a meeting of Russian Orthodox, that is a um, a Christian group or a, a kind of church, uh, and Buddhist monks to discuss meditation. It was noted that Buddhist meditation is not prayer. Um, and, and in that sense, it's different from uh, Christianity. It's, it's not responding in relationship to an ultimate being outside of oneself, but an internal tool for reorient for reorienting one's worldview. However, there is considerable similarity between the Buddhist sense of mindfulness and the Orthodox Christian tradition uh, that addresses guarding the heart. The goal of any fellowship of faith is to lay aside personal agendas and work to support one another. Christ's vision of the kingdom of God, in which sharing is central, stands in direct confrontation with worldly empires based on greed, power, and control. Christians are called to change societies through lives of loving presence, just as it is through a caring Sangha that Buddhism lives, so it is through the life of an engaged church that Jesus works toward healing a broken humanity. Right. Let's turn now to chapter 11, Partnerships for Social Justice. We'll start with social engagement. Faith communities should reach beyond worship and devotional practices to change a world overflowing with tragedy. And justices should move us to tears, a tender heart, and shared action for social justice. If we lack such tears, we lack devotion. Both faiths, Buddhism and Christianity, uh, preach a social vision that promotes love for neighbors, meaning all those around us. The people that we interact with on a daily basis, or maybe even people that literally live beside us. The Ten Commandments provide the ethical foundation for the way that Jesus calls followers to live in the world. Both faiths deepen connections in order to address injustices. Uh, the author specifically lists the example of the death penalty, though noting that this issue is debated. Uh, some are very passionate that the death penalty should be abolished, that it's unjust and uh, and uh, inhumane or barbarous. Sometimes it's uh, innocent people are put to death, but uh, there are better ways to punish even the guilty murderers or other people um, than putting them to death, according to some. But others disagree and think that it's still a protective measure um, in dealing with uh, violent crimes, especially murder. So Singa and Church lift us to see the bigger picture and the social justice implications of our dynamic interrelatedness. Faith communities compete with non-faith-based communities, uh, such as globalized economies, which exist to promote their own aims, um, such as corporate-generated consumerism and market greed. Working together on such issues will make us more appreciative of our fundamental need to be mutually supportive. How can faith communities confront injustice? Christianity sprang from a prophetic tradition where God calls for the establishment of just communities with the human's test being how the poorest or the weakest are treated. Christ promoted a path that attacked the idolatry of wealth while also reminding followers that humanity does not live by bread alone and that faithfulness would be defined by those who fed the hungry and who consider oppressed people as brothers and sisters. After studying theology abroad, the Peruvian theologian Gustavo Gutierrez realized 
His education had not prepared him for dealing with the ravaging economic oppression of his homeland. This led him to write a book uh, which sparked a movement known as liberation theology. His book was called The Theology of Liberation. Um, he taught that Jesus lived and worked among the poor and today suffers in the middle of brokenness, calling the church to leave sidelines of comfort to serve those in need. Though some have abandoned the ethical religion of Jesus, Gutierrez was re-articulating an original message of Jesus. So some Christians want to focus on just worshiping Jesus, but don't pay that much attention to Jesus' teachings. But Gutierrez wanted to change that and focus on the practical things that Jesus taught, especially about helping the poor, things that were overlooked or ignored by um, some Christians. Some Buddhists have begun to call their practice Congregational Buddhism or engaged Buddhism to emphasize a commitment to social justice. These communities are dedicated to an activist ethic and often out of principle have sought to be less authoritarian in structure based on their vision for social equity. Buddhists should work for justice where morality is expressed with liberality, impartiality, and generosity toward others. This sense of partiality encourages all Buddhists to be liberal-hearted in giving aid to the sick, poor, traveling, vulnerable, elderly, oppressed, and needy. Buddha taught that through compassionate moral values, a spiritual path can emerge to confront social injustices. We should not even speak harshly because angry speech can undergird violence, which can lead to more violence in a never-ending cycle of destruction. A Buddhist liberation theology has emerged, which works to establish the best of social and economic theory and practice, focusing on social issues with a perspective of Buddhist teaching. Let's turn to rejecting violence. Ours is a violent and inequitable world. Citizens of the United States live in the most militarized country in history. Many of its, expendit many of its expenditures on weapons are justified for use as being peacekeeping initiatives. Um, ironically enough, um, but many Americans believe that the strong military makes peace more likely because people don't want to fight us. Uh, People don't want to fight against America because they know, or other countries don't want to fight against America because they know America is very strong militarily. So there's peace. Uh, at the same time, the percentage of Americans in prison is higher than the, per the percentage of incarcerated citizens in any other nation state worldwide. A clear similarity between Christianity and Buddhism is the rejection of violence to resolve problems. So both these religions teach that overall violence should be, re should be rejected. Uh, some Christians reject violence while, at least in theory, while not opposing governments that sanction its use. Yet Christ called us to refuse violence and said that peacemakers would be blessed. Pacifism is often dismissed as impractical, that is, the view that um, you should not fight and uh, under any circumstances, even if, suppose if you're attacked or not even if the, the cause is good, you should not fight at all. Uh, so that seems impractical, but sometimes, but it was the vision of Jesus, more or less. Uh, he taught against the use of violence. Uh, Jesus offered a revolutionary way to engage the world. But is it even possible? Is it just idealism. Uh, how can we confront evil without protecting ourselves with the opinion of limited necessary or the option of limited necessary force? 
according to Christianity, God has a preferential option for the poor. This is expressed because the poor are most often the victims of injustice. When the powerful use strength unjustly against those of us who are oppressed, then the immorality of the promoters of evil will be judged. Because ours is a violent world, our faces will be slapped and we will be persecuted. What matters is how we respond. The focus of the message of Jesus stands against the use of violence. Jesus was the victim of the harsh violence of the cross. While both Jesus and Buddha rejected violence, neither called for toleration of evil. One should be spiritually violent against evil. Uh, so a different type of violence, not physical violence, but what we call spiritual warfare, fighting spiritual battles. Uh, so in contrast, Buddhism explains that in cases of self-defense or in the protection of many, an act of killing may become necessary. A stark example of violent protests against military violence includes the accounts of both Buddhist and Christian Vietnam War protesters who committed sometimes fatal acts of self-immolation. During the 1960s, some Buddhist religious leaders set themselves on fire. Some Quakers, that's a different Christian group, the smaller one, the one that's very focused on matters of peace and, peace and justice, uh, but some of these members also set themselves on fire. One Buddhist leader refused to say that these acts were unethical, but most Christians have condemned such actions because Christians must do no harm, including even harming themselves. So these acts actually continue as some Tibetan Buddhists have set themselves on fire to protest Chinese rule um, in more recent times. While Buddha rejected the sacrificial offering system of Vedic rituals, he was not only promoting humaneness to animals, but also putting the Sangha on a course that emphasized that all forms of violence are harmful. Not even violent sacrifices in the name of truth are acceptable. Though one critic argues that the historic focus on the violent death of Jesus has made Christian history an unending parade of violence, many see the entire life of Jesus as an expression of nonviolent action. On the cross, Jesus is participant in humanity's suffering. One Christian also claims that the cross and resurrection are signs of blessing for Tibetans, as they are human realities that belong to all people, not just one people, but all people. As Tibet has experienced its own form of emancipation, or its own form of crucifixion, and the subsequent resurrection of its wisdom. For Christians, as we go into all the world to preach, we go in peace. The invitation to Christianity is to a life of faith, hope, and love, free from coercive, uh, free from coercive, coercive violence. Christians are called not only to live at peace with God, but also with all humanity. So Christians are called to be uh, people of peace. Okay, uh, we'll skip this section, oppressing religion. We'll pick that up next week. And let's just turn to the attendance assignment uh, for week four. Again, for all these, you should be writing one to two paragraphs or one page maximum. So the question is, same every week, what is the main idea you took from this week's lecture? So that is, what do you need to do to get credit for attendance for the week is answer that. Again, just one to two uh, paragraphs. Um, it's best if you can at least write in complete sentences, um, just so... Uh, and put this in your own words. Don't just copy the notes. So I uh, 
know that I can see that you're thinking and interacting with these ideas. Uh, and if you would like some extra points, you can do the extra credit assignment, which again is one to two paragraphs or one page maximum uh, to answer these two questions. Number one, how are the Buddhist Sangha and the Christian church similar? How are they different? Number two, give one example of how Buddhists and Christians have worked for social justice. So one example, one example from the past, and then describe a social issue today where they can work together to promote justice. All right, so that is the extra credit. Again, one to two paragraphs or one page maximum. So if you do both of these, uh, your assignment could be anywhere from two paragraphs to two pages. All right, so we'll pick up again next time with oppressing religion. We've got a little bit left in this chapter and then a couple more chapters in this book we're covering. Uh, so again, this book is sort of an appreciative overview of Buddhism for Christians. And um, it's highlighting more of the similarities or the things, especially that Christians can learn from Buddhists. But then later on, we'll look at maybe another type of perspective and see what Christians especially hold as unique or what makes what we think makes our faith unique and as Christians and uh, uh, where we would draw the line, at least in terms of Buddhist teaching, where we would disagree or uh, find our own teaching preferable uh, to Buddhism or where we would not be able to agree with Buddhists. So that's what we'll get to towards the end of the class. Hopefully we are striking a balance between uh, interfaith dialogue and learning from Buddhism, as well as asserting the uniqueness of Christianity, uh, which we'll do later on. So, uh, next week again is the midterm exam, and then we'll have the next lecture in two weeks. So please get your assignment to me by email for the next week or so. Um, and if you are behind, go ahead and on uh, previous assignments, go ahead and get those to me as soon as you can, and I will respond to you um, as I'm going through um, grading and get, get back to you as soon as I can, next few days or so. Uh, hope you're all are doing well. Hope you're enjoying this class so far. This is probably a unique class for you as well as it's unique for me to teach this class. So hopefully we're all learning together. Uh, hope you all have a great week and good luck on the midterm next week. It's going to be a lot of multiple choice, true and false, some matching um, a couple of short essay questions. I always give a fair amount of extra credit as well. So I give you the best possible uh, chance to, to get a good grade. Uh, and it is going to be open book or open notes. So you can feel free to use the class notes. And it's just going to be online, of course. You'll just take the test and send it back to me by email. Uh, so hope you're all ready for that next week. And hope you all have a great week. And we'll see you next time. Take care.